I have asked LeadTime to send this inverter for testing, but as always, my review will be independent. In this video, we will see if it can run my fridge, and if it delivers on its 1000 watt promise. I will check the sine wave, the max load, the idle power consumption, and I will take a look inside. At the end of the video, I will show you an electrical diagram for this inverter, with wire and fuse sizes. Before we dive into the test, let's take a quick look around. It comes with these nice terminals. The bolts are M6. I'm reviewing the European version. The American version has a display mounted on the side. The European version has this AC out. In the American version, this is not present. It comes with a display. But honestly, the display is not very accurate, as you will see later in the video. You will also get a remote control, which is handy if your inverter is installed in a hard to reach spot. The battery cables that come with it are about 50 cm or 20 inches long, so keep that in mind if your battery is further away. These cables are 6 gauge or 16 mm square. As you will see at the end of the video, I recommend using 4 gauge or 25 mm square. One thing to note are the fans. I ran a load at 250 watts for 10 minutes and the fan didn't kick in. The sound when the fans are on is what you would expect. They're not the loudest, but not the quietest. This inverter costs around $130 in the US, while a similar 1000 watt inverter from Renergy is priced at $165. Let me mount it on the test board, but before connecting, I will use a pre-charge resistor to avoid sparks. This one is 10 ohms. Search for ceramic resistor if you want to get one. Let's take a look at the idle power consumption. By multiplying the battery voltage by the current the inverter is drawing at the moment. We have 13.29 volts. And... 0.67 amps. We have an idle power consumption of 9 watts. This is pretty good for this size inverter. They claim the inverter is 91% efficient. So let's test it with a 250 watt load. The current going into the inverter is 19.20 amps. And the voltage 13.08 We have a total input power of 251 watts and at the output we have 235 watts That brings us to an efficiency of 93.5% That's quite good for an inverter Let's now test the 1000 watt rated power and the 2000 watts surge capacity. This heat gun is about 800 watts and this is about 200 watts, which will make a total of 1000 watts. After this test, I will turn this one off and I will put this one on number 2, which will draw about 1800 watts. And then let's see how long the inverter will last. Now we're drawing 810 watts. Let's add the space heater. We're drawing about 1060 watts. This will come down in a moment. I did these tests before and it can handle this amount of power for a very long time. So we can say the 1000 watt rating is accurate. Let's now turn off the space heater and increase the power of the heat gun. Now we have a shut off. It didn't take a lot of power for the inverter to turn off. 
we didn't even see higher uh, or more than 1000 watts. So I think the claimed surge power of 2000 watts is actually non-existent, which is actually the case in many high frequency inverters I've tested. This is a sine wave when there is no load applied. Looks very clean. Now let's apply a load and see if it changes. Still remains very stable. A good thing to see. Can the inverter run my fridge? Yes, it can. My fridge is rated at 220 watts with a surge power of about 900 watts and the inverter handles it just fine. However, it can't run my microwave, which is rated at 1140 watts continuous, but that's to be expected. A nice feature that this inverter has is when it shuts down due to an overload, it restarts itself once the overload is cleared. Let me show you. If I run a heat gun and then add a small heater at setting number two, the inverter will turn off due to the overload. But as soon as I turn off the heat gun, the heater starts up again automatically because the inverter is resetting. Heat gun is on. I will now turn on the small heater, which will turn off the inverter. There's an overload. Turn off the heat gun. And now it's automatically recovering. They claim that the USB outlets on the inverter can draw 3.4 amps. So let's test it with this small USB tester. We will set it to 3.4 amps and press the start button. Obviously I did a test before and it passed. I also tested the two USB sockets and they both draw 3.4 amps. Before showing you the diagram, let's take a look inside. Everything is soldered nicely, with no loose connections, which is a good sign. If we compare this to the Guyendal inverter, they use crimp connections. Not a problem, just something to note. The heatsinks aren't as thick as on the Guyendal, but the area where transistors are stays cool even at a 1000 watt load, which is good for the longevity of the electronics. When I review cheaper inverters, the outside becomes very hot, which will decrease the lifespan. Here's a schematic detailing the wire and fuse sizes for this inverter. We calculate the current as 1000 watts divided by 12 volts, giving us 83 amps. Dividing this by the efficiency of 90%, we get 92.5 amps and multiplying by a 1.25 safety factor, we get 115 amps. A 4 gauge or 25 mm square wire rated at 105 degrees insulation temperature is suitable. This is welding cable and it can carry 150 amps. The fuse should be between 115 and 150 amps. So, a 125 amp mega fuse is perfect. I'll put the links to all these components in the description. This 100 amp hour lithium battery can run the inverter because we are just below the 100 amp limit of the BMS. Overall, the lead time 1000 watt inverter is a solid choice for running appliances like fridges, electronics, computer, fans and TVs. You don't have to worry about multiple devices running at the same time. If you want to support the channel, you can buy the inverter through the link in the description, at no extra cost to you. Let me know which inverter you are using, and suggestions for product reviews are welcome. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.